Well, I want to talk this morning about two hallmarks of an authentic Christian experience, uh, whether that's for us as individuals or whether it's for us as a church. Authentic, authenticity. Now, those are two words that are very commonly used these days in lots of different circumstances, from some very mundane, uh, you might say trivial things, to more important things. So you might see advertised on TV some food product or other that promises you an authentic taste of India. Or the product may say this is based on, on an authentic Italian recipe. So we want to have that authentic flavour and that authentic taste. But then it can be used as well in things that are a bit more important and more, more serious really. So you get a phone call from somebody who says that they're from your internet provider and uh, they need to sort something out. Well, is this an authentic call or is this a scam call? And then maybe you're planning uh, a holiday and you've seen uh, a property advertised uh, to rent or whatever it is and uh, you hand over the money, but uh, has the money gone to somebody who's bogus in actual fact and uh, is purporting to offer uh, a holiday or a property that doesn't exist. And then, and I suppose this is one of the ones that's particularly significant these days, people's profile online, their online profile, is it genuine? Is it authentic? And even if somebody's not um, trying to be doing something that's illegal, is their profile reflecting who they truly are? Or is there something that's not quite right? People count authenticity to be important. It is important. We want to know that uh, friends or people that we know are authentic, that they're genuine, that we know who they really are. And if that's important for us in day-to-day -day life, in all these different circumstances, how much more important it is when we come to thinking about our relationship with God and what it means to be a true believer in God and a true follower, disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, because we notice that Jesus considered authenticity to be a very important matter. Some of his sternest words in the New Testament are those that he speaks uh, where he denounced his people for being hypocrites. In other words, not authentic, not genuine. And he had strong words, searing words of condemnation for them. So that's what we're going to look, about, look at this morning. We're going to think about authenticity. Now, there are lots of ways that we could look at this, but I want to look at it from uh, two verses, really, that Paul wrote in a, his first letter to the Thessalonians, uh, 1 Thessalonians and in chapter 1. Now I've looked at this passage before from another angle, from another perspective, but I want to look at it today from this perspective of uh, authenticity in terms of Christian discipleship and experience. Because Paul was writing to people that he had heard about and was reported to them how they had turned from idols to believe, uh, to the, rather they turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. So that's the heart of their Christian experience. They had turned to God and that's where we need to begin. So this morning, as we think about authenticity, that's the starting point really. Have you turned to God to serve the living and true God? Have you turned away from your idols? That's the first thing. But then, of course, what's the evidence that that is authentic, that that is genuine? Because there can be some, uh, some things that are merely words uh, and they don't last. Uh, there's the phrase, isn't there, that something is a flash-in-the-pan experience. It doesn't last. Or 
I can change the picture. Uh, if anybody's, uh, if ever you've had uh, fireworks or something, uh, I'm sure you know the experience of lighting the firework. Uh, it starts to, perhaps a Catherine wheel, it starts to turn around and then it sort of fizzles out and uh, nothing comes of it. Well, Paul had evidence that these Thessalonians, Thessalonian Christians, their Christian experience really was authentic and really was genuine. They truly had turned from idols. They really had turned to the living God. Something real had happened within them in their experience. And he highlights that in two ways in verses six and seven of chapter one of his first letter to them. I'm going to read from verse four of chapter one of his first letter to begin with. So he says, brothers loved by God, we know that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and with deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord. In spite of severe suffering, you welcomed the message with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. And verses six and seven have two things there that I want to highlight by way of expressing authenticity. They became imitators of us and of the Lord. That's the first thing. Verse six, and then verse seven, secondly, you became a model to all the believers. And notice how Paul speaks about those two things as being part of the proof for him that the gospel had come to them in power. It had been transforming. Their turning to God was real and genuine. And these are the two things that he highlights then. You became imitators and you became a model. So that's what I want us to look at this morning. Those two things, being imitators and being a model. He says, you became imitators of us and of the Lord. Now, the word that Paul uses here about imitating has given an English word, mimic, to mimic. Now, when we think of the word mimic, we probably think of uh, something comical, where people are poke, poking fun uh, at somebody, and they try to imitate them, they try to mimic them. And uh, just on the BBC uh, news, or rather BBC website, just this last week, I noticed that there was an item there saying that um, the spitting image had created this new um, puppet image of Boris Johnson some years ago. There was a program on the TV that um, poked fun of politicians and people in the public eye, and they had these uh, somewhat grotesque sort of uh, images of them. And apparently now they've created one for Boris Johnson. So we tend to think of mimicking and imitation in that kind of comical way, uh, poking fun. But it meant something much more serious than that uh, for Paul. He said, you became imitators of us and of the Lord. And in saying that, Paul was just echoing truths that Jesus himself had said. Now, that's why I read the passage from Luke 9 uh, earlier on, where Jesus was saying that part of being a Christian means following Jesus. It means denying oneself, so putting oneself in the background, and rather taking the path of Jesus and being his follower and his disciple. And in those days, that meant being like the teacher, accepting the teachings of the teacher, following the pattern of the teacher. So Paul is just echoing that. And interestingly, he says, doesn't he, in verse six, you became imitators of us 
and of the Lord, and of the Lord. So there was something real in their experience in this regard. And perhaps I could just pause here at this point to say that uh, there is a sense then in which uh, we need to be aware of this uh, as believers, uh, as we're in fellowship with one another, that there's a sense in which people may be observing us, new believers perhaps, new to the faith, and what they see in us and what they hear from us will become for them potentially things that they will follow. So there's a great responsibility. Can I speak to those who are parents? Uh, your children sometimes unconsciously and also consciously may imitate you, imitate your patterns of behavior, the way you speak, the way you behave, the things that are important to you. Imitation is something that happens in all sorts of walks of life. And Paul is saying, for the Christian, there is an imitation that takes place. Well, how does this imitation work? In which ways? Well, it works in terms of belief. It works in terms of belief. Uh, notice what Paul says uh, in this verse. Uh, in the same verse 6, in spite of severe suffering, you welcomed the message with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. So part of their imitation of the apostles, of Paul, and of the Lord was in accepting and adopting and embracing their teaching, their instruction. And when we turn to the book of Acts, we discover something of what that teaching was. It was about the need for the Messiah to suffer and to die, and that Jesus was the Messiah, and that there was a need for repentance for our sins. And they had embraced that. That was part of their imitation of us and of the Lord. Because the apostles were only teaching, or I should say, they were teaching uh, teachings that were in accordance with the teachings of Christ himself. And later in chapter 2 of this same letter, uh, Paul can say, uh, You received the word of God which you heard from us. You accepted it, not as the word of men, but as it actually is, the word of God. So Paul's word, the apostolic word, was the word of God. And these believers then had come as part of being Christians. The reality of their turning to God was that they embraced and imitated that teaching. It became theirs as well. So there is this imitation in terms of belief. That's one thing. But then there's another way in which uh, we imitate as well uh, in the Christian life. And that is in terms of behavior. And in fact, when Paul wrote to the Corinthians, he was very blunt about this. And at one point he says to them, be imitators of me be imitators of me. And you might say, well, why on earth would he say that? Well, it was born out of concern. He was concerned for the Christians in Corinth that they were being directed or being influenced by other people who didn't have their best concern at heart. Uh, and so he was saying to them, uh, some of you become arrogant. And that was true of them because of these other influences. So Paul said, no, that isn't the way to go. You need to go a different way. You need to go the way of humility. You hadn't arrived, as some people were trying to say to them. So imitate me as I follow Christ. Imitate me from the point of humility. 
was what he was saying, for their own good. And so it is that they, these Christians in Thessalonica, Paul knew, yes, these knew what it was to be imitators of believers in the best way possible. So look at what he says in chapter 2 and verse 14. You, brothers and sisters, became imitators of God's churches in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. You suffered from your own countrymen the same things those churches suffered from the Jews. And when we read in the book of Acts, in chapter 17, of Paul and those with him going to Thessalonica, we read that the coming of the gospel there was accompanied by mistreatment, threats, persecution. And despite that, the people, or these people who became believers, they embraced the gospel, though they knew of suffering uh, themselves. It didn't stop them from welcoming the message. Paul says that in this verse where he's talking about imitation back in chapter 1 and verse 6. You became imitators of us and of the Lord, and in spite of severe suffering, you welcomed the message with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. So here were real, genuine imitators. They embraced the message, and they followed as well the behavior of Christian disciples, both in the apostles that they could see, and in believers in another part of the world that they hadn't actually met, but knew about their sufferings. They had imitated their behavior as well, in a noble and in a good way, that proved the genuineness of their experience. And this just reminds us, of course, that being a believer, turning to God to serve the living and true God, is not necessarily going to be plain sailing, if we can use that expression. It can mean persecution and suffering and humiliation, perhaps. These things can be the lot of Christian people. And it could be for you that that comes in the um, in the shape of family members who are a bit scornful, derogatory, making fun of you, from your husband, from your wife, from your children, from your parents. Or it could be from other citizens. That's how it was for the Thessalonians. See how Paul says to them, you suffered from your own countrymen, he says. And that can be the experience of people who are believers and have turned to serve the living and true God. It could be in the workplace, it could be from neighbours, people who um, don't understand perhaps certain decisions that you make, certain choices in the wider community. The Lord Jesus Christ spoke about having to take up the cross. And to face that cost as being imitators, as being disciples of him. So here's one hallmark then of authentic Christian experience, being imitators. But the second thing, and we find this in verse 7 then of chapter 1 of Paul's first letter to the uh, Thessalonians, is of being an example. Being an example. So here's what he says. You became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. You became a model. Now it's interesting here that Paul uses the singular word says you became a model. He doesn't say you became models. He could have said that. And that's interesting because 
he's kind of underlining there that you as a church, you as a congregation became a model. So you've got an identity. You together are saying something and being something to even to society around and even to other believers elsewhere. Now, of course, it's true that individual believers will be, in one sense, a model. But it's interesting here that he's thinking very much of the church as a community. And there's a challenge for us there, isn't there? We're not meeting physically together, of course. But when that will take place, whenever it will, um, and people come into us, what do they see of us as a community? And when people perhaps know of us as Christians uh, and link us together, perhaps even now in society and know, well, he's part of the, that Christian group and she is as well. What do they make of us? What do they see of us? In which way are we models? But in particular, being models to other believers. That's what Paul is emphasizing here. You became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. Well, I want to just highlight two things on that aspect about being models. The first one I want to say is that they became uh, proclaimers. They became proclaimers. As a community, they had a powerful testimony and a powerful uh, example. Notice in verse 8, the Lord's message rang out from you. He says, the Lord's message rang out from you. Not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has become known everywhere, he says. And Paul uses a word there that he doesn't use elsewhere. Uh, a word meaning to echo. It echoed. I'm sure we've all experienced children going into some sort of cave or other where there is an echo and making sounds to hear the sound of the echo. Uh, when I was a um, student in, in North Wales going on preaching engagements along uh, the A55 uh, before the days when it's uh, basically a dual carriageway now there's a there's a kind of a tunnel around Penmai Maur and uh, the tradition was that you'd sound your horn as you went through this so you knew who all the locals were because they would sound their horn going through this and you'd hear these horns echoing around this tunnel. I don't think they do it now with the uh, new tunnel that's there. But Paul is saying this message of the Lord echoed around everywhere. And it echoed around in part because the lives of these believers, they were seen, they were heard in their different ways. But of course, they also spoke as well. It rang out in various places. They were a model to believers in Macedonia and Achaia because they were proclaimers in their life, in their words. And I will remember, I'll never forget uh, hearing Vernon Hyam saying that in his first pastorate, uh, which is in a rural setting uh, in West Wales, he'd been there for quite some time. I don't remember how long now, but uh, there, there was one particular day, I think it was one of the elders in the church or somebody else anyway, came up to him and said, well, Mr. Hyam, we've been observing you for some time now. And now we are going to listen to you. In other words, they had been watching his life and his behavior, if you like, being a model. And because of the authenticity of that, they knew that the words that he would then say carried with it the force 
of an authentic and a genuine Christian experience. And I'm sure we all want that, that people will be able to say that of us individually and of us as a church as well. How easily the gospel can be discredited by what people see in the lives of believers individually, collectively. What do people say of our Christian community? So they became models in that way, that's one way. But the other way in which they became a model was in terms of their work as well, their labour. Now, Paul, as he writes to these Christians, as I said, was able to say to them that they had observed and they had seen things in Paul's life uh, and behaviour. So he says, you know how we lived among you for your sake. He writes to them. And he later on in chapter 2 says, um, you remember brothers, our toil and our hardship. We worked night and day. So that's one of the things that Paul is able to say, you know how we lived. You saw the model, you saw the pattern in our lives. And one of the things he highlights was work and behaviour. And this had obviously made an impression on the Thessalonian Christians because at the beginning of his letter in chapter 1 he says in verse 3 we continually remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith your labour prompted by love. Quite clear then that these Thessalonian Christians had on the one hand imitated the Apostle and those with him in terms of their commitment, in terms of their commitment to the gospel and his cause. And in turn they had become a model to other believers and I think this is one of the ways in which they had become a model. Their work, their labour, these things had become known in amongst believers around the ancient world where they found themselves. So imitation and being an example Really, they're like two sides of the same coin. They're very closely linked. They're intertwined together. But the main thing I want to emphasize as I close is that these are marks of authenticity. What it means to be a genuine Christian. Now, sometimes in society, people, there's a saying, isn't it? Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. But we're not really in the business of flattery here. We're not trying to flatter one another. In fact, Paul talks about flattery uh, in chapter 2. He says that we weren't in that sort of business, he said, of flattering. And this matter of being imitators, being a model, is not trying to flatter one another. Ultimately, we are doing this as an expression of honour to the one who is the only one who is worthy of being followed. The only one who is worthy of us modelling to others. We are here to model Christ to society around us. We are here to model Christ even to one another. As Paul sought to do to these believers, for the Bible writers, there was really only one person who was worthy of being imitated, of being a model. And it is the Lord Jesus.
He said, pick up your cross and follow me. And when we do that, we will be a blessing to others. We'll be a blessing to one another within the fellowship. And we'll be a blessing to people in society at large, as Christ himself was that blessing. May God help us to do that. Amen.